It is an absolute delight to be here with you and to participate in this conversation. In the vast modern mythology on the origins of violence, there may be no more revealing image than this. A muscular man poses shirtless on a table, arms outspread, lips curled in an oval, eyes rolling up to the sky. It is the anthropologist Franz Boas, icon of relativist understanding, striking the pose of an indigenous youth in search of human flesh. A little over 10 years ago, this image of Boas imitating a hamatza, or cannibal dancer of the Kwakwala-speaking peoples on a nearby Vancouver Island, was engraved on a medal awarded by the American Anthropological Association to a distinguished scholar for exemplary service to the profession. In this instance, the sanctioned image of the discipline established by state peoples to record the lives of the non-state peoples they aimed to erase depicted a Western scholar naturalizing the stereotype of native violence. The image of Boaz as an anthropological cannibal breaking the mind-body binary to participate in the lives of his hosts is a classic example of the discursive violence of modernity. The violence functions through a framing device. What we see is the story of Boaz as a non-judgmental friend of his hosts innocently joining in their behavior pattern, a recurring motif of cultural relativism. What we do not see, what is framed out, is the history of violence the dance represented, answered, and redressed. And yet, as a remnant of the history that produced it, the image carries its past like an unseen residue, encoding the violence it obscures. And this concentrate of erased origins can operate in the present as a memory capsule, a conceptual stimulus that can enter our bodies and infuse us with erased sensations, reactivating and converting silenced body knowledge. We can use this photograph as a memory capsule if we study it in the context of the dance that produced it rather than of the science that constructed it. In other words, instead of reading the photograph as a history of anthropology, of Western representations of the other, we can respond to the ways indigenous people have envisioned it as an archive of movements reproduced through Boaz's body. What then is the history recorded in Boaz's posture? Boaz is displaying with clear fidelity the motions of a Hamatsa dancer as he enters the dancing house, returning to the people from his journey to the spirit world, that is, the forest, and he's encountered there with the man-eating spirit, Bach Bachwell Nuxue, who feasts upon the bodies of the living. He has risked his life on behalf of the community, defeating the spirit and receiving his dance, but in the process, he has been infected with the madness, and he is now a vector of the violence that destroys him. Boaz's widespread arms here represent his ravenous hunger. He is searching the room for bodies to ingest. His quivering fingertips, which you cannot see, convey his wildness. He is out of his senses, almost like a frightened animal. His ferocious cry we cannot hear, but it's depicted by the oval of his open mouth. Boaz the cannibal is uncivilized here. He has crossed over to the animal side of his nature and must be tamed or purified before he re-enters the human community. The question is, who will civilize him? The purpose of this talk is to train this question of influence, who is civilizing whom, on a moment of epistemic shift in the global circulation of knowledge. Between 1893 and 1911, imperial race knowledge underwent a dramatic realignment as certitudes about the superiority of white civilization began to splinter in the face of some surprising new evidence about the interconnection and equal endowment of the world's peoples. Now, the official history has it that the decisive critique issued from the pen of Boaz, an immigrant to America, but he was also influenced by an unacknowledged source. A network of indigenous peoples on the northwest coast of America had made use of Boaz as a host body to enter and alter the world that came to colonize them. In the face of smallpox and state erasure, the Kwakwakiwak of Vancouver Island had created a system of knowledge called potlatch, which is a means of converting violent self-other relations into nonviolent host-guest relations. When Boaz arrived, the Kwakwakiwak aimed to civilize him out of the self-other logic of state science and into the host-guest logic of the potlatch by teaching him the ideas encoded in their Hamatsa dance. Guided and trained then by an indigenous intellectual, George Hunt, 
Boaz underwent a mental conversion process, ingesting the Hametz's host guest philosophy. The effects were seismic, leading Boaz to critique the master concept of colonialism, race, and the violence that it institutes. The indigenous influence on modern thought indexed on Boaz's body has been excluded from the formal history of knowledge because it isn't written down, but it is inscribed in media that survive today. The Kwakwakwak narrate their histories at the potlatch, an intertribal summit where people renew their social bonds through the exchange of gifts. During this process, the guests uh, who receive the gifts pay witness to the hosts who dispense them as they recollect and encode their histories in media ranging from masks to totem poles, songs, and the Hamasa dance. And the inheritance passed down at the potlatch and then validated by that hospitality is the narrative or history that encodes a family's message. When the mnemonic devices then that housed these messages were salvaged, as it was then said by anthropology, the messages were disconnected from their origins and suddenly made illegible to history. To read the messages, we must counteract the legacy of collection, reuniting the narratives with the host communities who hold the interpretive keys to decoding the meanings. What then is the narrative of the Hamitsa dance that came to unfold Boaz? Here you see the story as recorded by George Hunt. In 1894, Boaz visited George Hunt on Vancouver Island, witnessed the potlatch, and learned the story. It is about a chief, Nunwakawe, whose fellow villagers have disappeared. His sons locate the source of destruction, the spirit Bakbakwelanuksue, and they journey to his house, where a strange woman lives within, rooted like a tree to the floor. The woman shows the boys how to destroy the spirit, and they kill him. Nunwakawe then journeys to see the woman, and he asks who she is. Do you not know who I am, she says. I am your daughter. Nunwakawe is overjoyed. He digs for the base of the root, hoping to detach his daughter and take her home. But the deeper he digs, the thicker the root grows. Nunwakawe therefore tries to cut the root. Do not do that, his daughter cries out, or else I will die. It is best that you just come sometime to see me. Although she can never return home with her father, she gives him the Hamitz a dance. As soon as you get home, she says, give a winter dance. The narrative then that the Kwakwakwak told Boaz to explain the Hamitz a dance is a parable for the rupture of modernity and the thought process it catalyzes. It is a story about the search for one's roots in the wake of a devastating catastrophe. The community has disappeared, but a man has survived necessitating a search for his roots. No amount of digging or of cutting away can heal the destruction of erasure visited upon his family. Thus the necessity of dance, a memory capsule that infuses the living with the body knowledge that reconnects them to their lost relations. The narrative then defines the Hamitsa dance as a gift of memory born by the dancer, a guest in the spirit world who becomes a host in the realm of the living, reconnecting in motion the present and the past. Memory is about the influence of the dead over the living. It is the thing we forget that grants us the gift of memory, returning us to the connected selves we did not know were lost. Boaz called the story a myth, but as George Hunt explained to him, stories are also a form of history. The Hamitsa dance developed amid cataclysm on the northwest coast as smallpox reduced the indigenous population by some 90 or 95 percent. There are traces of this history in the story of the spirit Bakbachwelanuxiwe, whose body is covered in mouths, much like the body of a smallpox victim whose skin blisters into dimple-shaped pustules. The first dancers to perform possession by the spirit also resembled victims carrying a plague. Claiming to have been transported to the spirit's house, they returned infected by his madness, vectors of the invisible agent destroying their bodies from within. But the dance would have remained only that, a performance of suffering, were it not for the political genius of the Kwakwakiwak. In the wake of smallpox, the chiefs of some 20 previously factious principalities realized they had to halt conflict if they were to avert social disintegration. And their solution, potlatch, redistributed wealth, soldered ties, and converted violent self-other relations into host-guest relations. In the context, then, of this unsteady transition, the Hamitsa dance carried out three functions. 
first. It served as currency that motivated the circulation of heirs, thus the extension of political ties between separate but now unifying communities. Second, it also monopolized the means of violence, creating a cadre of young men who enforced the code of the nascent potlatch. But in contrast to a modern state, this Hamatsa society did not monopolize violence by inflicting it, because third, it converted the violence into something else, something unprecedented, by demonstrating in public the body knowledge its members had acquired, the concept of living inside the pain and surmounting it so as not to pass the vectors of violence on. Over the course of four dances, beginning on all fours in a childlike crouch, each time standing a little straighter, a Hamitzer dancer progresses from a wild toward a civilized state, sublimating his destructive tendencies and donning red cedar bark, the symbol of life. And here you see my teacher, the great Hamitzer, Marcus Alfred. At the start of this dance, the boy is so selfish that he aims to devour everything, even human beings. By the end, he has been cured of his hunger and inculcated into his future as a giver. Through the drama then of one boy's progress, the society demonstrates its ideal of reciprocity, converting enmity to hospitality. On the morning of November 24, 1894, the Kwakwakiwak extended the logic of their dance one step. Boaz, their guest, had risen early to join an ecstatic kind of gift-giving procession for their neighbors, the Goskimoch, but it is likely that he expected only to watch and take notes. Before he knew what was happening, he found himself extending his arms to a native who wrapped rope around his wrists and linked the extended arms of the guest to the outstretched hands of his host, George Hunt. And as the procession wove to town, catching and throwing an unseen ball of healing energy called Nabalach, the rope Boaz grasped tied him in, a new link in the ever-widening circle of conversion. This is how ideas cross borders. Having returned from the field in 1895, Boaz was out of work and in need of income, and so he took a freelance assignment for the Smithsonian, the construction of a life-size diorama. Having diagrammed a scene, the return of the Hamatsa, Boaz removed his wool suit to index for the camera the precise articulations of a dancer's musculature. A second photograph shows Boaz clothed, a hoop behind him, representing the aperture in the dance screen from which the dancer emerges. Note the position of his arms. They are locked at the elbow and extending forward, the wrist cocked, fingers articulated, like the pinions of an eagle taking flight. Boaz is trying to find balance. This concept, finding balance, which we perform unconsciously when crouching, is conceptualized in hyalicula, a motion that takes place during the final stage of the dance, as the initiate moves toward calm, struggling to process the pain within. His outspread arms suggest the form of the double-headed serpent, an agent of death that, if properly handled, transforms into a vehicle of healing and renewal. Soaring across the room, listing now to one side and now to the other, the dancer has found his center, it is said, balance in a world of rhythmic change. Suddenly, he retracts his arms and pulls back upon his chest all the pain he has known. He seals his lips tight, leaving only a crack, and with a hiss, he sprays like water from between his teeth the violence he feels. He has pulled his pain down and ejected it. It is outside his body. Now, I have only a minute to sketch the profound changes that resulted from Boaz's immersion in the Hamasa dance and potlatch, his realization of the sophistication of indigenous thought, his critique of race, his idea of culture as an interactive process. But tying all of these changes together was Boaz's shift from a self-other outlook to a host-guest outlook. In the four decades between this photograph, shortly after Boaz learned a posture, and 1930 when he returned to Fort Rupert to index the body knowledge of the Hamitsa dance on film, the imprint of host-guest relations left by the potlatch gradually came to influence his thinking about global politics. In his breakthrough 1901 article, The Mind of Primitive Man, a title that tragically inflicted a trace of the racism it critiqued, Boaz identified the self-other problem about to propel his civilization in the opposite direction of a Northwest Coast potlatch. A, quote, feeling of nationality, unquote, that he described as too potent, propagating the belief in each empire that, quote, it is right to preserve its peculiarities and to impose them upon the rest of the world. 
Yet this violent urge could be converted into something else. The feeling of fellowship might widen, expanding past the horde to create a unity of the tribe, pushing on to create what Boaz called a neighborhood of habitat and between neighborhoods, amity and interconnection. Having witnessed the potlatch, Boaz held out hope that what he called the herding instinct could expand outward. The Hamasa dance had shown him that people could experience transformations, sublimating pain and hatred and converting it to hospitality. Boaz adopted this dance, as the photograph shows, because he drained the concentrate of the memory capsule. He tried to learn the body knowledge. He mimicked its motions. It would not be possible to replicate the postures without a coach, yet Boaz offers no hint of that story in his ethnography. He has severed himself from his sources. But a thread of connection exists in a manuscript Hunt mailed to Boaz, which shows who likely taught him the motions. The account details the return of a Hamatsa dancer, the scene Boaz later depicted in his diorama on November 24th, 1894, the day Boaz joined in. The Hamatsa was Hunt's eldest son, David Hunt. In the light of this history, our picture of Boaz makes little sense. It frames out the narrative that created it until we reframe it alongside an image not of violence, but of nonviolence. This photograph taken of David Hunt at the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago, in which he poses in the final dance of the Hamasa, Hilikila. He is moving to Nakahala, the slow and steady beat. Two beats, then one, a balanced progression. He is tall, controlled, having pulled down his center and released the violence within. Like Nunwakawe in the narrative, he has located his roots, visited and returned from the realm of the dead. The posture of his lower arm demonstrates the weight he bears upon his return from the spirit world, the consciousness earned from the experience suffered, Gluguala Kaso, the real supernatural gift. This is a picture that belongs on a medal. It could be placed on the opposite side, a narrative disclosing what Boaz came to learn while recording the silencing in which he remained enmeshed. On the day that story can be acknowledged, state scholarship of non-state peoples will convert an imprint of erasure to the value of survival. It will hyalicula the hurt of colonial violence, converting some pain into gluguala. When Western investigators of non-Western societies like Boaz abandoned their assumption of an Archimedean point, experimenting with physical participation in the practice of knowledge making to derive insights from the intellectual ecosystems of their hosts, they formalized indigenous inventions already inscribed in the body knowledge of dance. The education of Boaz by Hunt alters our view of who holds the pen, the instrument of inscription, and thus who can hold the power in the social scientific encounter. It also calls attention to the deep history of erasure that is our common inheritance, preventing us from recognizing the foundations of knowledge by often marginalizing the minds of peoples of color. If participant of observation adumbrates some contributions of human science to modernity, and if indigenous people played a key role in making the method, then the so-called subjects of scientific study are in fact agents in the creation of modern knowledge. All people are modern people, faced with the historical structure, struggle between rupture and reweaving, born with the burden of searching for a memory capsule to reconnect them to their roots. The autochthonous modernity of indigenous people emerges from their experience of violence, a rupture that compelled them to advance the frontiers of knowledge. They have sent waves of influence flowing the opposite way, waves we see frozen in the face of Franz Boas releasing the anguished call of a cannibal dancer. If we look past the staging of the photograph to the narratives of the society that owns the dance and transmits the motions, we are not looking at Boaz representing indigenous violence. We are ingesting, as he had done, a memory capsule that came from the lost daughter of Nunwakawe. Narratives like this are not myths. The myth is the necessity of violence, the story of an original condition of savagery alleged by the state through the infliction of stereotypes of non-state peoples that justify further state violence. Narratives, in contrast, must be seen as histories, messaging devices that free us from mythology, host bodies carrying cosmologies of transformation. We may ingest these memory capsules through the motions of our bodies, 
infusing our musculature with semiotic and non-semiotic thoughts and sensations. If we attune our senses and our perceptions, if we align our bodies as Boaz did to propagate the dissemination of these waves, it remains possible to reconnect the stories to the places and the peoples who infuse them with meaning and even to decode the messages they contain. In that moment, the knowledge of nonviolence enters us and we become carriers of the gift. Questions? Conrad Harper, New York City. If I'm right that smallpox was brought to the New World by Europeans, is there any suggestion that Potlatch recognized that perhaps the smallpox there has origins from European visitors? Yes, it was recognized as having origins from Europeans. And also, the Europeans, by the 1860s, had a cowpox vaccine which was denied to the indigenous members of the encampment in Victoria, which ultimately spread smallpox all the way up the northern coast. So there's an overlap of epidemiological and biological and political factors, um, meaning that uh, the population did not have to decline as rapidly as it did. And both the Hamatsa and the Potlatch were the indigenous response that emerged to solve this problem. Uh, Michael Silverstein from Chicago. Um, I, I th I, I'd like to underline and, um, and have you perhaps respond um, with your own emphasis um, on something which was a theme in both of, the, both of the presentations this morning, but one which was vividly, vividly illustrated by um, the fate of the different pieces of knowledge, you might say, right. um, that you've managed now to put together for us. Um, that is to say that there's a, there was a a rubric difference of what was considered myths, what was considered history, what was considered um, customs, what, and, and of course the documentation of things like dances um, uh, and material culture and so forth. These are Western rubrics um, of, of what you might want to call segmentation and separation of kinds of knowledge right. that in fact are at tremendous variance with the nature of knowledge um, and the way it goes together uh, in an indigenous context that you've revealed for us. And I wonder if you would com um, comment further on the enterprise of anthropology that itself now needs to be healed from those kinds of misguided rubricizations. Mm -hmm. I think that's why both of us use the word knowledge, as you have done, because the idea of a field oriented toward the study of knowledge writ large is providing an opening now for us to bring in all of these things that have been categorized separately, but that you cannot understand unless they're seen holistically, right? Which is breaking the fundamental binary of modernity, which would tend to separate, say, nature and culture, uh, black and white, and so on. Um, the healing process is difficult uh, because these images are also, and cultural documents, intensely loaded and different people own different properties. And so I think one of the most interesting experiences, at least for me, is the experience of returning with archival information and finding that the people on the other side know far more about the document than what has been sitting in the library. And so in, as a historian, all of a sudden, history is going on live. And that's the experience of watching a potlatch as well. It completely reconceptualized my own understanding of history almost by taking me toward a Benjaminian kind of spark of contact between the present and the past. So I guess uh, from the perspective of the American society writ large, the healing dynamic for all of us uh, could be in this expansive kind of worldview um, that indigenous people who have long been on this land um, have been, have been uh, disseminating for centuries, but that perhaps now we are able to listen to. And this could be useful for solving any number of, of issues that we face, including democracy. Mm -hmm. Right now, mm -hmm. the question is um, Dr. Luke Cato. 
Hi, from Washington, D.C., Edie Tail. Neither of you mentioned the Museum of the American Indian in Washington. I was curious about whether it was a place that has been helpful for scholars and whether it's been a place that has been helpful for um, disseminating the ideas that, um, that you all have been able to unearth and articulate. I think Isaiah is saying I get <laughs> that one. Um, it's complicated. The, um, <laughs> the source collection is the High Museum in New York. That has some pretty shady origins that we would want to gulp at today. Uh, the, the dream that created the museum that now sits on the Smithsonian Mall um, is a wonderful one, and one which is controlled by the indigenous curators and staff of that museum. It's difficult to understand for someone who does not have ties to communities, but the kind of concept that the collections should be displayed and annotated and um, it, as an invitation to come and participate from a native point of view in some of the things that are going on is really very exciting. Um, the success of it and how clearly it goes back to the New York version of the museum um, is a story that I think is probably yet to be told and this is perhaps not yet the time to tell it. Yeah. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, all of you. <laughs>